Thank you. Thank you. I want to talk about a big problem which ought to get a lot more focus. It's this. Over the long term, the savings of a typical family don't grow as much as they should. I'd like to illustrate this problem with the puzzle of the missing billionaires. Let's start with this fact. One million dollars invested passively in the U.S. stock market in 1900 would have grown to 30 billion dollars today. Ka-ching. <laughs> now, you might say, wait a second, a million dollars was a lot of money in 1900, and you'd be right, it was. However, historical records indicate that we had 4,000 millionaires in the U.S. in 1900. Now, if each one of those millionaire families had children at the average rate, we would have 30 families living today for each one millionaire family back then, which conveniently means that those 4,000 millionaire families in 1900 would have spawned 120,000 billionaire families living today if only their investments had been able to match the return of a passive investment in the U.S. stock market. Now, according to Forbes magazine, we've only got 400 billionaires in the U.S. today and virtually none of them derive their billions from their ancestors' millions in 1900. So what happened to the other 119,600 or 99.7% of them? Was it so impossibly difficult to match the returns of a passive investment in the U.S. stock market? Well, evidently it was. And that's exactly the point I want you to take away from all these missing billionaires, just how incredibly challenging it is to capture the returns offered by the market. What makes it so difficult? Well, besides consumption and taxes, we face two major investment-related uh, enemies opposed to the successful growth of our savings. First, it's no secret that the financial industry takes a hefty toll in the form of commissions, fees, and spreads, <coughs> which add up to a large fraction of our expected investment returns. The second, even bigger problem may surprise you. It's ourselves. Yes, the sad truth is when it comes to investing, we are our own worst enemy. Now, there's been a lot of research over the past 30 years in the field of cognitive science showing through ingenious and often hilarious experiments that we humans carry around uh, a whole bunch of baggage from our evolutionary past, which is a hindrance in our 21st century financial environment. These many cognitive biases, <coughs> which were helpful to us for survival on the African savanna, make us sitting ducks on the New York Stock Exchange. Now, if all those missing billionaires didn't drive this point home, maybe a study by two researchers from the University of California named Barber and Odin will convince you. In their paper aptly titled, Trading is Hazardous to Your Wealth, they analyzed the actual trading records of about um, 100,000 households. What they found was that active non-professional investors lost 6% per year relative to a passive investment in the stock market, 6% a year. Ouch. So what can we do to stop ourselves from being fleeced and fleecing ourselves? Well, there's been an effective solution available for the past 60 years or so called modern portfolio theory. It's a simple but powerful idea and it won its creator, Harry Markowitz, a Nobel Prize and it gave birth to the trillion dollar index fund industry. The basic idea is that we should seek efficient diversification by spreading our investments across the entire market portfolio, thereby helping ourselves to the only truly free lunch in investing. The savings crisis we're experiencing today would be much less acute if families had been investing in this passive manner all along. It minimizes the fees and commissions we pay to financial middlemen and by restraining us from active trading, it protects us from ourselves. There's only one problem with this solution and it's a big problem. Most of us just can't accept it and even if we do adopt it at some point in time, we generally can't stick with it. Why? First, it's those cognitive biases at work again. 
we don't like to see ourselves as passive, static, or uh, average in anything that we do in our lives. The second, more rational reason, is that most of us believe that bubbles do occasionally occur. And the tyranny of passive index investing not only prevents us from avoiding them, but it actually has the perverse tendency of making us invest more heavily in overvalued assets. A great example of this occurred at the height of the Japanese stock market bubble in 1989, when it was claimed that the one square mile of land underneath the Imperial Palace in Tokyo was worth as much as the entire state of California. A passively indexed market capitalization weighted equity portfolio at that time would have needed to be 43% invested in Japanese equities. 24 years later, Japanese equities are still 70% below their 1989 peak. Eh, magi. That's Japanese for ouch. <laughs> we need a better, more appealing solution than pure passive investing. A solution which resonates with our human nature and keeps us safe from our deep-seated instincts that we default to in the heat of the moment. The car industry found a solution to a similar problem, that of preventing drivers from following their knee-jerk reflexes and losing control of their car in a skid. They invented anti-lock brakes and traction control, and now it's virtually impossible to spin a car. Just ask my 18-year-old son, Josh. He's tried. The investment industry needs to do the same, designing an investment solution for us that prevents us from spinning out of control and to offer it at a low enough price where we'll all want it as a standard feature. We need to accept, indeed embrace, our natural human inclination for action and use it to our benefit rather than our detriment. It calls for nothing short of a new third way of investing, taking the best of passive investing, the low fees, the diversification, the simplicity, and marrying it with what's good in active investing. So what is good in active investing? There's more consensus on the answer to this question than you may think. Who wouldn't want to look in the mirror and see Warren Buffett, the Yoda of value <coughs> investing, or George Soros, the master surfer of market trends and cycles, looking back at us? Buffett's value investing, buy assets for less than their worth, and Soros's momentum investing, the trend is our friend, appeal to us as common sense principles of sound money management. Why not try to distill and systematize their approaches to investing? It turns out that codifying the basics of value and momentum investing is not so difficult. Of course, a simple set of rules is not going to capture the genius of these two legendary investors. However, this active passive synthesis, let's call it active index investing will compensate by being super low cost, there's no need for expensive experts, and it will be fully transparent and easy to understand, no magical, mysterious black boxes either. It's just how we imagine that we'd like to invest, and therefore we're much more likely to stay the course and earn the long-term returns that we ought to. And <clears throat> active index investing, based on value and momentum, uh, according to historical evidence, has increased return and decreased risk over the past 100 years, all the way back to the early 1900s. So why haven't more ordinary savers converted to active index investing already? Well, in the words of Master Yoda, simple it is, easy it is not. <laughs> And that's just the case with active index investing. It's simple, but not easy. It requires patience and discipline, which are not always our strongest suits. Second, active index investing is the natural evolution of the ideas of modern portfolio theory. And so it's had to wait for phase one, the low-cost, far-reaching index funds, the building blocks to develop, which has only happened in the past five to 10 years. Finally, I hate to say it, but active index investing is anathema to the high fees of the wealth management industry, and we know what that means. I'd like to summarize with a final analogy. We all know that smoking is hazardous to our health. 
Yet, despite all the anti-smoking education, laws, and even ostracism, there are still 40 million people in the US who smoke. Now, I know I'd have your undivided attention if I told you that I had invented a cigarette which in every way was identical to a Marlboro. You light it with a match, same smoke, same addictive properties, but instead of causing cancer, it would lower your cholesterol, it would improve your academic performance, <laughs> and it could be sold at one-tenth the price of a genuine Marlboro. Now, Philip Morris might not like that too much, but the rest of us would welcome that as unambiguously good news indeed. What I'm telling you today is that in the domain of investing, we can achieve this exact result. We can take something which is hazardous to our wealth, the expensive, frenetic, seat-of-the-pants management of our savings, and by adding some common sense rules and discipline, we can convert it into something that allows our savings to grow as they should, and satisfies our human need to be dynamic and responsive to our ever-changing, sometimes crazy world. All for one-tenth the price we currently pay. Whoever makes this happen, and it's very much a question of when, not if, will have solved a problem which is costing our society just as many billions as the more universally recognized problem of smoking. Thank you.